Welcome to the Answer Podcast. I'm your host, Manuel Calo. This is the podcast where we explore stories, challenges, and insights from those serving in our community and our country, both in and out of the uniform. The views and express in this podcast are those of the participant and do not reflect any of the official policy or position of any military branch, government agency, or affiliated organization. And then do not forget to follow us on Instagram and YouTube as Answer Mail for more, for more updates and future episodes. Joining us today is Captain Rosangeli Correa Torres. She's born and raised in Puerto Rico. Captain Correa is a U.S. Army Reserve Signal Officer at 25 Alpha. She's a company commander and the CEO of the Latinos in Uniform LLC. She's also a cybersecurity compliance contractor driving secure information practices in the civilian sector. Without further ado, I want to present Captain Rosangeli Correa Torres. Hey, Rosangeli, ¿cómo estás? How are you doing today? Oh, yeah, everything good. Thank, thank God. The, 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 the one and only Rocco from the Latinos in Uniform finally <laughs> make it an appearance to the Answer Podcast. You know what I mean? I know Lieutenant Colonel Montalban, uh, he was the, actually, fun fact before we continue, he was the link between you and I to for me to actually conduct the podcast for the Answer. Uh, so appreciate it, and it's like very nice to, to meet you. Absolutely. Hey, so Rocco, let's start with, with your bio. So who is Captain Rosangeli Correa Torres? So uh, the audience and the listeners can actually learn more about you. Absolutely. So I, I get just kind of a quick background on uh, where I grew up, where I come from, and, and how I got to where I am today. Uh, again, born and raised in, in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Uh, I moved to the United States with my family back in 2000, 2001. Uh, with my family. Uh, the reason why we moved was because I do have a little brother with uh, special needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Northeast, Massachusetts was really where at that time, there were a lot of different opportunities for him. So that's kind of a, a quick background as to what brought us to, to Massachusetts. Okay. Um, being in Massachusetts, um, we were kind of forced to learn the language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing a lick of English other than <laughs> a couple of things we've learned from uh, movies and their subtitles. Yeah. Uh, but having to learn the language, the culture, mm -hmm. uh, at times it was a little isolating, right? So mm -hmm. it, it definitely made me better appreciate uh, who I am as a Puerto Rican, as a Latina, as a Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And and we'll, we'll kind of discuss a, mm -hmm. a little bit of, of that later. Uh, so being in Massachusetts, I, I did go to college in Boston. Um, and when I was roughly 25 years old was when I began to look into the possibilities of joining the military. Okay. So, uh, when I walked into that recruiting office, uh, again, uh, about 25 years old, I was able to lock in a contract, uh, contract for, for basic training and, and federal OCS over, in, uh, what was gotcha. Fort Benning, Georgia at the time. Gotcha. So, so what the actual motivation for you to actually look for the, for the army? And then that's the first question. And then the second question is like, do you locked in only the army or you looked into the army or you had any other options like Marine, a Navy, Air Force back then when you started to look for options? Uh, great, great question. So I think what originally made me gravitate towards the army mm -hmm. was the ability to change from reserve to National Guard, upward mobility, uh, horizontal mobility, and having, uh, I guess, some of the specific jobs that, that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always been interested in everything that is uh, IT, cyber, homeland security, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I, I knew that I wanted to take that route. And uh, the Army was kind of the only branch that... Um, really guaranteed that position as a signal officer. So that's kind of mm, what okay. made me lean towards towards the Army. Gotcha, gotcha. So so you were looking more to the cyber community, et cetera, and in this case, uh, Signal Corps. Um, now, it, it was, it was, is that your uh, undergrad is towards uh, cybersecurity or something, um, you know, technology-related? Yes. So, so my undergrad was actually in international affairs. Okay. So, um, even, even while I was studying international affairs, trying to get an understanding of the interconnected interconnectedness of the world, mm -hmm. uh, really set me up for success okay. as far as how nations relate to each other, uh, how history 
pretty much predicts where we are and where we're moving forward. And then being able to weave in the technology aspect of it okay. uh, was kind of something that I pretty much knew I was going to go into. Gotcha. And then, so just to clarify, so you finished your undergrad and then started to look for, for options, uh, looking to the military, right? Yes, absolutely. So I was about 20, 20, 21 years old when I finished college. Mm, okay. And um, w within that time, uh, I, I was able to uh, get a position working with uh, a company that later got brought out by Grubhub. So that's oh, kind of where a lot of the, the marketing, advertising, uh, yep. social media experience, I guess, came from. Now, okay, so that's where, where we, we can see all the social experience. Like back back then when you were 21, 22, working in that company, that's when it kicks in for you now because we're about to talk about Latinos in uniform in a minute. <laughs> I know that's a, the interesting topic. Um, now, so when you went to the Army because you, they had whatever you were looking for in, as far for like technology, cybersecurity, et cetera. So how, how was your approach to that recruiting uh, NCO or non-commissioned officer, like, hey, I want, I want to go enlisted, but I want to become an officer. How, how did that work for you? Um, I think in the beginning, especially not having, neither of my parents served, so I, I really did not have anybody kind of guiding me through mm -hmm. the process, mm -hmm. uh, doing a lot of research just online, uh, asking some friends that were in the service as okay. far as how to gear that conversation. Mm -hmm. And and everybody, you know, especially at that time, having a bachelor's, everybody kind of uh, suggested the mm. idea of taking the officer right. route, right. which is how, uh, how, how that sort of came about as far as that conversation. Yeah, so basically for those that are listening and they have a bachelor uh, under the belt right now, they can actually apply to enlist in the United States Army, in this case, the Army, and then they can request to go to OCS to become an officer. That's an option. Uh, now, so so once you actually got that contract and then you say, hey, you're going to go to OCS. So, so what was next for Rocco? Like, what happened? Uh, so as far as that, well, I guess by that time that I had orders cut, um, I knew that my physical standards have to be um, within the requirements and, and even above that, mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't going in as a 17, 18, 19 year old. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was, I was, in, I was well into my twenties. Mm -hmm. So I knew that the expectations uh, might be a little higher, especially going into OCS. Uh, so uh, once I went to MEPS and signed that contract uh, within two weeks, I was shipping off the basic training. Yeah, and then so and then you went to actually to basic training, and how was that basic uh, training for you? Like at twenty five years old, what was that, what was the experience for you? Oh, <laughs> you, you laugh, you're like, okay, let me let me see how I can say this. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, every every morning, every morning, I was like, what? Open my eyes, I was like, what am I doing? What I'm doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> and then factoring the, the the language, right? So what about the language uh it, it influenced the way you actually perform in basic training or you were like all you were very proficient at english when once you got to basic i was i was i was proficient, very proficient. Uh, okay. I, had, I had graduated college by by that time so gotcha. i was i was comfortable with the language okay. and e okay. even the spanish came came in handy as well so yeah and then can you relate any any studies on basic training back then for like brand new private uh rosangeli correa torres Drill sergeants uh, all around screaming to you, or waking up for PT. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm I'm too old for this. Uh, so, but um, I I think just the the way in which I tried, and I and I think I successfully portrayed mm -hmm. myself not only with drill sergeants who, funny enough, one of them was was from my hometown in, in Puerto but Rico. So, <laughs> so, hey, story of my life. So, uh, and I think another one was Dominican. So. Uh, but but just being able to uh, continuously be respective mm -hmm. uh, or you know uh, respectful to to them, but also uh, having that trust from my peers who were probably six seven years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. uh, I think being able to gain that trust and also try to try to lay low about uh, my plans for for uh, OCS. 
Okay, okay. You don't want a lot of people to know that you actually were you were going to OCS afterwards. Now you finished basic training, and then what was next? Now you had you had actually had to OCS. So how how was that transition after you finished basic training? Yes. So right after I finished basic training, my parents came to you know to to the basic training ceremony and all that good stuff. I had to do. I, I believe I spent about two days with them. Mm. And then I, I catch, uh, I hitched a ride with, with a battle buddy of mine from basic training, who's also going to, to OCS. So it was, you know, graduation Thursday and by Monday morning, I was already in, um, in OCS. OCS, which is OCS stands for officers candidate, candidate school, which is one of the sources that the army has to do for officers. You have ROTC, OCS, West Point, and direct commission. And OCS is one of the routes that, that actually people can, can do to become a second lieutenant in the United States army. Now, uh, so when you, once you got, it wasn't Benning, right? So you went to Fort Benning now is for more, uh, to do OCS. That's where your OCS was. Or yes, that's correct. Uh, that's correct. Now, so how was the um, OCS like schedule? Like, hey, I know they have three phases. They have by colors. How how was now coming from basic to now start doing OCS? Um, I think comparing, and I get asked this this question quite a bit, mm -hmm. especially those who are interested in officer candidate mm -hmm. school. Is uh, was basic training harder or was OCS harder? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I I think from from my standpoint having expectations of OCS being different because of the requirements, right? You need a bachelor's. And this is also a commissioning source for a lot of NCOs with eight, nine, 10 years nine of experience. Years. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I expected the treatment to be a little bit better, uh, but that wasn't the case, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was difficult in that sense as well, where the ages, you know, we were a little older, a little more experienced, uh, not only folks with military experience, but also with educational experience, mm -hmm. but it was like going through basic training all over again. Right. So, so that's, uh, I, I keep hearing that, that once you go to OCS, it's like going back to basic training. Cause you have, uh, do you have, do you have drill science, right? If I'm not mistaken on OCS. Uh, or? So they were all, uh, prior drill sergeants. So I think they still had that mentality. That mentality. Of, same mentality. And then I think like the hardest uh, thing to do in OCS is the history test, I think, that you have to know everything. <laughs> that, was, that, that, that was a tough one. It's about an entire week um, sitting in a classroom from the same gentleman that has been teaching the class for about 20 to 30 years. So it's the same <laughs> individual for every class. Uh, but... Uh, Thankfully, especially with my background and my bachelor's, that's mm -hmm. something that I, I always found interesting. Right. I, I always found very interesting. Uh, the, the challenge for me was just like everything else, you're staying staying awake, right? You're mm -hmm. still getting up and doing PT in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, to include six to uh, six mile to nine mile rock marches and everything else in between. And then you're sitting in a classroom all day. <laughs> so that, that was one of the biggest challenges and uh dates and names and battles thrown at you uh but between myself and a, and a battle buddy of mine we actually hosted the history classes so we had a group okay. of us that would kind of go through it some of the key points and and uh learning mechanisms in a sense so thankfully all gotcha. of us were able to pass history class gotcha and then uh, i was to i meant to ask you once you actually uh, locked in that contract for basic as enlisted the first, uh, do you locked in with the army reserves from the get-go? Like, right? So yes. You, okay, army reserve. And then the second question is like, do you win 25 series uh, or you had on a series uh, as enlisted? Like, I'm not saying not related. Uh, no, it was the same. It was the same. So when you go through basic training, um, especially if you're going to be a, uh, you're an officer candidate, which is an 09 Sierra, mm -hmm. I believe it, it's, it's still the same code. Uh, mm -hmm. MOS code right now, so you go in as an 09 Sierra, but my contract did have me as um, I guess upcoming signal officer upon graduation uh, of, okay. of uh, OCS. Okay, so I think I think that's what I was trying to get at. So everything was locked in from once you, you actually signed that your basic contract, it was locked in to become a 25 Alpha 
officer once you go to the OCS uh, right and then graduate because um, I, yeah. I know that some some folks that go to OCS they have to go to a, a OML so they have like different jobs um, they have to actually apply for and you get rank, rank and stack but in your case you were actually locked in to be to become a 25 alpha from your basic training right correct at that time which was about early early 2016 uh, anybody who was either in the reserve or national guard already mm -hmm. had that in the contract oh, okay. any anybody going active duty uh w would have to be placed on that oml list and that uh, would all depend uh, on how many jobs uh, sure. of that specific mls were available at okay. that time now answer my question okay so it's because the reserve have had you all locked in throughout and then active duty they have to have to compete on the oml uh Correct. now once you finished your history test i think is the last test of the ocs and you got your butter bar so so what was next for for roco after you're like hey i'm complete now uh, what was your next steps after completing ocs so right after that i went back to massachusetts mm -hmm. and i had a, a a position in a movement control battalion where i was a signal officer okay. Uh, yes. uh, uh, battalion S6 OIC. Yeah. And then how was that for you? Like how, how how's the work as an S S six or a signal battalion officer? A communication it, officer? It was it was great. It was great. I think really having a, a team that knew what they were doing, um, not only in the technical aspect, but also in the in a military sense as well. Uh, there are certain things, especially coming right from, you know, kind of the street, like they say. Uh, going to basic training and going directly to schools is completely different than being in an actual unit. So being outside of w what is trade-off in schoolhouses, uh, things work operationally different. And so having a team, a section that knew what they were doing uh, and, and really kind of guiding me through through some of those things uh, was extremely beneficial. And then how, how long you you stay as the uh, S6 on that battalion? I was there for... I would say about four or five years. And and the reason why was because uh, we knew that we were going to be deploying. And so already having okay. that background uh, of, of having having established those relationships with those individuals, I, I knew was going to assist in being um, de deployed in a sense mm -hmm. with them. Okay, and then so so now your army reserves. What about your civilian in the meantime? How how was how do you complement your civilian job with the army reserve at that time? Uh, so at that time, I was an information system security officer for mm -hmm. for a defense contractor. Okay. So there were a lot of aspects again that I was able to take back and forth. Um, especially things dealing with, with cyber, with securing information systems. That's also something that I was able to use mm -hmm. as a 25 Alpha, as a battalion, uh, S6 OIC and a moving control battalion. Nice. Uh, yeah, moving control battalion, they, they, they do a lot of stuff, basically more like a, a moving uh, equipment and personnel throughout AOs, et cetera. So they focus on that, but you were the actual communication officer for that, that battalion. You're such a subject matter expert of all communications guru. Now, so, so from Boston, uh, what was next? You stayed from Boston five years and then, or, and then I think you moved to Tampa uh, right after or how that worked for you? Yes. So right after I came back from deployment, I had a, a, an opportunity to uh, pick up a brigade at six position in, mm. in Queens, New York. So I was there for, for a little bit, making that transition directly after after my deployment. I just needed to change the scenery, mm -hmm. uh, so, some, something different. Uh, and while being a brigade at six over in Queens, I applied for a position, an ADOS position, so active duty uh, operational support position in Tampa. At a, at a Tampa Meps, which actually did not know if it existed mm. up until I, I, I saw it appeared. And that's your current position right now, since then? That, no, that was uh, an ADOS position that I had picked up. Um, immediately after that was when I jumped into my command position. To your, to your com company command. Yeah, we, we talk about that. So how's company command for you now? Jeez. Earning my paycheck. <laughs> it <laughs> Earning is tough. my paycheck. <laughs> so, so what was uh, was your company like? Your company obviously is in Tampa, but it's a reserve uh, unit, right? 
I guess so. Even though, and that's uh, I guess how the reserve differs from National Guard is that I am not bound to the state. So at, right after picking up the position working in Tampa, um, I saw the opening for a company command position in Fort Knox, Kentucky, mm. uh, which is with a with a training division over in Fort Knox. So I travel every every month from from Florida oh, okay. to to Kentucky. Gotcha. So your actual unit is in, in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then from Tampa, yes. you actually t you travel to take care of business, and then obviously you have uh, active duty personnel. The, the works uh, on your company, I think it's your operation, your supply sergeant, et cetera, they maintain your company, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, and then the challenge is that, that you you are a commander 24 seven, although you're army reserve, right? So you're on call. If something happens with the unit, you have to actually be, be flexible and, and, and take care of that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then what, what, what do you do now in Tampa in your civilian side? So on my civilian side, I am a cyber, um, this kind of like a cyber compliance contractor. So I work with a, a federal agency and thankfully I was able to find a position that is remote in, in which it uh, okay. allows me the, the flexibility to, um, to, to be here at home, but also be, uh, tuned in to my civilian matters. Nice. And then I'm going to, I'm going to head back. Uh, I, I meant to ask you on your deployment, uh, any insights from your deployment experiences back then, like that you want to share? And I think you were also sharp victim advocate. You you we work in that too. So any anything you want to share with the audience about that? Yes, I, absolutely. I think with any deployment, there are going to be challenges, not mm -hmm. only interpersonal, but also uh, with those around you, family members, and and whatnot. But one of my biggest takeaways was to take care of yourself. Uh, especially being my first deployment and wanting to pour absolutely everything into my position as a battalion as six officer, but also as a sharp victim advocate, which mm -hmm. is a uh, sexual harassment, assault, a uh, response prevention victim advocate. Um, I, I, it took a lot of effort for me to uh, also know when to step back, mm -hmm. when to step back and, and take care of myself. That is a position that, uh, it's very emotionally driven. It's it's sensitive in nature, and uh, the takeaway for me was determining and and knowing when to take care of myself as well. Okay. No. Yeah. So def most definitely, the sharp sexual harassment uh, advocacy uh, across. It is a sense sensitive uh, by nature. I mean, because like we we know some there's some multiple cases that are happening and having and somebody that take care and advocate for this uh, victims. And it can be it can be anyone. Like it could be like man, it can be woman. It's not only related to one uh, only. Uh, but having somebody that actually learn the process and help these victims to overcome the challenges, it, it is it is a, an important role in the in the military as a whole. So, yeah, but it, it's a uh, you know rewarding for you as well. Um, sure. Now, so yeah, and then let me see for here. So, the, the Latinos in uniform. So, what's the inspiration of Latinos in uniform? Now we're gonna switch a little bit on Latinos in uniform, and and this is what I actually I know about Latinos in uniform uh, as a whole as a social media, but I didn't know who the face was because I don't I don't know, I don't know what was uh, the one who was posting uh, mostly on Instagram. So, what's the inspiration for you to actually do the Latinos in uniform social media? Sure. So this idea came about probably in April 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got to give first a shout out to, you know, everything that was at the time and still is the Military Fresh Network, Military Connect, Dope Military, because I think they really paved a way for uh, a lot of this military online presence that we see today, mm -hmm. even prior to, you know, the Instagram boom, the TikTok boom, uh, everything else was that, that was taken off at the time. So they were a huge inspiration and how this idea came about. And what I envisioned for this and, and still continue to envision is for this brand to be a one-stop shop for all matters pertaining to Latinos and veterans serving in the military uh, or have served in the military. So 
Uh, there are a, a lot of pre-existing organizations and any nonprofits that are geared towards our audience. But uh, I, I think this being a one-stop shop where everybody can come to uh, and, and, and talk about some of those uh, great things, some of the accomplishments. Uh, so not really not looking to reinvent the wheel, the wheel but wanting to emphasize uh, our successes, our victories, and everything that we've overcome to get to where we are today. No, most definitely. And and I'm just opening here, like, this is your Instagram, and I see you have 54,000 followers right now on Instagram and growing. Uh, mostly, this is this is, uh, this is is when I actually knew about the Latino Sin uniform, and we had our first interactions because I, I have, I opened my own, you know, Latinos year towards uh, the, the service journal now. It was Nuestra Fuerza, Nuestra Gente no La Fuerza Armada, I, I rebranded a little bit. But this is what I actually uh, start seeing all your posts. And I think what you're doing is great. And, and again, you're highlight, highlighting a lot of the Latino community and what we do in, in uniform, whether it's going to be Marines, whether it's going to be Air Force, Navy, uh, Army, etc. And not only that, I think you actually had uh, police officers. You have like everyone and that's it's actually in a Latino role, right? Yes, definitely providing that space to, uh, like I said, hi highlight some of those milestones that, uh, that, that need to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And I think one, one thing that I also want to point out is, uh, right, we need to laugh ourselves, especially in the military. We got to make light out of the shenanigans that we endure uh, uh, con consistently being being in the service. Uh, but we also want to be able to confront some of those complexities and issues. So, right, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It, it's also really important to be able to provide that space uh, to, to have those conversations and uh, and this serves sort of as a forum, or, or my intent is for this to serve as a forum to to have those honest dialogues about things that are challenging um, within our communities. No, and, and I think you do. This is a great, great forum for for every every Latino that out there, you know, like doing uh, their stuff because like that's why my m biggest intent of opening my own page it was that like sometimes I was like people were getting unnoticed and they were doing great things uh, across the all, uh, all branches of service and I was like hey let's start like highlighting like those people that are doing great things maybe so people know what they're doing but it's a great it's a great uh, forum that you have there um, now it, let me see. So, so how how do you actually connect with the ANSA community, like between Lieutenant Colonel Montalban and you? It was through the actual Latino Latinos in Uniform uh, forum. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, w what I wanted this to be was focusing on the Latinos in Uniform uh, veterans, service members themselves, yeah. and and less on me. That's why. I think this is probably the first time that that I'm coming. Yeah. Uh, that that you're putting a face yeah, to, to, to the actual to the brand. Page. Yeah. Exactly. So even though uh, you know it's already been trademark and it's an actual LLC, I I wanted the focus to be strictly on Latinos mm -hmm. in uniform. So mm -hmm. the 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 connections that I have made uh, to include Lieutenant Colonel Montalban ha have all been through Latinos in uniform and its social media platform and presence. Yeah, and again, this is I think like you mentioned, it's the first time we are seeing the actual face between that page because like we're seeing all these posts, but we are, like I said, I didn't know who Rocco was. Like I was like Rocco, I have in my mind some something else, and then like I didn't know. Even like when you sent me the email with your bio and your photo, that was like, oh, so that's Rocco. I didn't know who Rocco was. <laughs> but it's great. I mean, you're doing great things with the with the web page and kudos that. to you. And I know it's gonna continue, uh, you know, growing in nature. Uh, and then let me see. Now, uh, was you like to travel, right? Do you like to travel? Uh, what's your yes. favorite travel and experiences? that you have and how that shaped your, your perspective and any other travels that you have made? Uh, so uh, any any opportunity that I get to pack up my black, my bag and, and, and go somewhere different, experience different culture, different food, mm -hmm. uh, different experiences is, is always great for me. And I think out of the places that I have been to, this still consistently stays at the top of my list and just hear me out, but Iceland is so underrated. Uh, I know we wouldn't think about it, especially being 
uh, in primarily warm climates and Iceland. whatnot. But if you have an opportunity to go to Iceland, it is it is beautiful. It's uh, great food, great coffee. I, <laughs> Listen, don't ask me. Wow, Absolutely you, great come on, coffee. you're from Ponce. You're from Ponce, Puerto Rico. <laughs> How you will say that yeah. Iceland has better, hey, better coffee? It is. I, I don't <laughs> you know. You should be biased better. to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if better, but it definitely uh, surprised me with, with coffee and just the, the food and the preservation of, of what is an entire volcanic island. So it is an island, just like Puerto Rico, but uh, obviously it being volcanic and, and cold and having the snow and all that uh, um, certainly has a certain feel to it. Uh, but definitely, definitely a location that I would recommend for vacation or travels or whatnot. Yeah. Iceland. Yeah. I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of posts that people are going to Iceland. I think it's in my, in my, on my to-do list. I've been in Alaska though, uh, but not, mm -hmm. not into Iceland. Um, but we'll see if I, I actually can go this Hibarito from Puerto Rico, like getting all, you know, <laughs> cold over there. Like, let's see <laughs> if you did it, I think I can do it too. Right. <laughs> With one <laughs> Iceland. I mean, who, who will know? Right now, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then you say that the best coffee is in Iceland. Wow. Oh, great, great coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Check it out. Yeah. So if you're listening, let's go out, check out uh, Iceland, go to kayak, and then make sure that like, you get a plane ticket to go. And then I think they actually have uh, cruises, right? They're going through through the whole peninsula. They have cruise ships. There. Yes, I believe they can, so. They can do that. Um, now, if you look back to your actual journey, what reflection you want to share with the audience on your Army OCS? any mentorship experience that you want to share and i know you might have a lot of mentorship experiences you know to tell just because the latino uniform by nature is all about mentorship anything you want to actually uh tell the audience uh i think something that i always heard was that it doesn't matter how much information you have how much knowledge uh, you're able to retain what you do with it is what really matters. Mm -hmm. So if it's one person, if it's two individuals, if it's a peer, if it's somebody that's just starting off, being able to share that knowledge and those experiences is extremely crucial, especially within the Latino community. I think um, we are, we just need to be consistently sharing those experiences Uh, we our, our our culture our our families our I, i guess personal bonding experiences call for it so not only within the military but also encouraging individuals to continue pursuing the education uh that, that the military uh you know op opens doors for mm -hmm. essentially so uh getting go get your bachelor's go get certifications go learn something new, take a coding class, whatever it may be, go get your master's. Uh, I think that is something that I always try to push for, especially even when I was working in MEPS, mm -hmm. those individuals that were joining the military or mm -hmm. at least considering joining the military, um, big proponent of education, of constant learning. The fact that we can never learn enough is, is always an advice that I have as far as that mentorship aspect. No, most definitely. Like that's when I was a commander. That's one of the biggest things I will I will, I will tell my soldiers. Like, hey, just make sure you you better yourself every day. Like, it's not only do your job and then go home. I know we all have all our own, you know, situations back home, etc. But when you have a little bit of downtime, trying to actually do something that's gonna grow you up as a person, as a leader, you know, because at the end. Um, We wear this uniform, we're gonna hang this uniform uh, when we retire, and then we have to think what's next, whether you're gonna do 20, 20 years in the service, whether you do five years, or whether you do eight years and then active duty and then transition to the reserve because you want to do continue to serve, but I need I want to be working to a cybersecurity agency that's gonna pay me more. Uh, but to get to that, then you have to, you know, better yourself, study, you know, uh, get your bachelor's, get your master's, et cetera. And it's a valid point. 
and and the army and the the armed forces as a whole is a, is a networking and mentorship structure and then stuff like you do in, in latinos in uniform matters because you can inspire other generations to from latino generations to actually they're doing great things and the ANSA community as well, because the ANSA is an affinity group that's geared to the Latino community in the sea services, and now they're expanding uh, amongst other services. As you know, you are from the Army, and you and I are from the Army. We're here in a, in a naval, you know, uh, podcast talking about our experiences. But at the end of the day, it's all about mentorship and who you, you can actually inspire. And I think you're doing that with your, you know, with the Latinos in uniform as a whole. That's that's amazing. Let me see. Now, so what advice would you give to anyone that want to actually become uh, go to the OCS? Like they're trying either to go to basic and apply for OCS or as a, they're going to basic as a whole. What advice would you give to that that's listening and looking for more information about it? Uh, particularly for OCS, one of my recommendations is really having... Um, I guess, clarity as far as why you're doing, why are you going to sign that contract? Mm -hmm. Why are you going to go to OCS? This needs to be something that is um, strong enough and motivational enough that when you're in that foxhole pulling security at two o'clock in the morning after you haven't slept well, you haven't ate well, uh, that this is going to get you through those difficult times. And that's something that I always told the the applicants when they were going through the Tampa maps is whatever that reason is for you, make sure it's solid enough to be able to get you through those difficult times. We can all join for any sort, you know, any sort of reasons, whether it's financial reasons, educational reasons, whatever it may be, make sure it's something that is embedded in you mm -hmm. and that is going to get you through, through those moments when you're wanting to pull the plug, when you're wanting to call it quits. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that would work the same yeah. for for basic training as well. When you're when you're hungry, you're tired, you're exhausted, you are wanting to pull the plug, make sure that the reason as to why you're joining is something that is uh, above and beyond uh, physical means. No, and, and again, let's go back to your story, right? So it was Rocco one day waking up in the morning to go PT, getting screamed by a three sergeant, <laughs> and open your eyes. You were like, "What the I'm doing here? Like I don't know what I what I'm doing here." But then. Looking forward, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, I overpassed, overcame all this stuff, and this is who I am right now. But looking back, I actually be appreciative, but appreciative of what happened. <laughs> I think so, right? In their standpoint. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> and then I, I think also, you might remember your drill sergeant's names as well. <laughs> yep. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody you will never forget. Okay. No, but yeah, so think about uh, any other services and uh, get more information. You know, ask that people that are actually doing this. Like, you can actually follow us in our social media. You can actually, I'll put, I'm going to post all the links below. You can actually reach out to Latinos in Uniform uh, social media or to the Alpha media, social media. And then if you need more questions, like, looking for uh recruiters etc we can actually point you to the right direction but this is what we're doing this to mentor the generation that coming uh, behind us but because like i said i'm 10 i'm 10 years in the service so i got 10 more to go and then like soon i'll be hanging out my uniform and then we need the new generation to continue picking up like what are we doing now you you like to read books right do you like books i do i do I've quite, so, quite, quite a few. Yeah, so any of the books that you would like to share with the audience that has some significant impact on your leadership style or as a whole? Um, I'm trying to think what I've been reading. Recently, I, I have been kind of bouncing back and forth between some uh, books relating to uh, negotiation. Okay. Uh, the, the, the reason why is, uh, I think allowing people, this isn't, you know, like a sleazy car salesman type book, but, uh, really having the other party or the other parties understand your point of view is, is something crucial when it comes to not only the military, but the civilian side, uh, 
having conversations with family members, significant others, whatever it may be, really having them understand your point of view and you understanding theirs is is sort of what I've been reading lately, just about focusing on communications, being a being an effective communicator. Uh, no, no particular book right now stands mm-hmm. stands out to me, okay. but uh, and, and mostly dealing with uh, n- negotiation, negotiation, and communication, communication. communication. Yeah, no, no, it's it's okay. Yeah, it's one because I know you like to read books. You had anything in mind to share with uh, with the audience? More than welcome, but more more towards like leadership, negotiations, and communication effectiveness sure. for for leaders. Now, so what do you like to to do to recharge in your off time? Like any any particular hobbies or anything that, that you like to do? Sure, I love to be outdoors, especially being in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's 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 not like being in New York or Massachusetts <laughs> where you can only do that, you know, two three months out of the year. So I enjoy being outside. I, I enjoy plants and flowers, and I, I think a lot of that stems back from from going up in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. uh, just being able to be one with nature in a sense, and uh, and, and and enjoying being outside and walking in the grass with my bare feet and, and just being outside and feeling Good. that sun is kind of how I, how I recharge. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like to do the same. Um, I'm more like in, in Richmond, Virginia. So I, I have all four seasons. I don't have like, like, uh, what's it called? It's like summer all, all along. Like mm-hmm. right now we don't fall and I was starting to get cold, but I understand where you're coming from. And, and I think I, I'm an outdoor sea as well. Rocco, um, Any last comment before we start closing out our podcast? Any recommendations, any advice that you want to give to our audience from your standpoint? Uh, my advice is to, kind of something that I had mentioned earlier, but to continue to learn. My dad taught me that, um, you know, somebody, which never happened, right? But somebody could take your car, they can take your your laptop they can take your phone they can take your house but nobody can take away your education mm-hmm. and that's something that always uh stuck with me and i try to share with uh, whoever i come across essentially so it it is a key point in everything i do uh, with latinos with my civilian job so continue to educate yourselves this world is uh ever evolving as far as the amount of information we're thrown, but being able to weed through that stuff mm-hmm. and being able to just continually, continuously learn, uh, you know, being a student forever essentially is, is one of the biggest uh, things that I, I could always recommend to somebody. Yeah, no, I appreciate your kind words. And, and I think somebody is going to take it um, and, and, you know, follow that mentorship that you, you shared with us. Well, Rocco, I appreciate your time for, for being us to, uh, with us today in the Answer Podcast. And again, it's an it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, finally meet face to face after, you know, so <laughs> many, I think two or three years we've known on social media. And now we have the opportunity to work together. And on behalf of the Answer Podcast, myself, Dan a month of band. appreciate it uh, to, to be here to, today with us. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to close here real quick. So for those that are actually listening, thank you for, for tuning in this episode of the Answer Podcast. It's been an honor to have Captain Correa Torres, uh, a.k.a. Rocco, with us today. Uh, she was sharing on her passion for service and the leadership. If you enjoyed this co- today's conversation, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram and on YouTube as Answer Mill. For more inspired uh, stories, before I actually close out, I want to actually share with you uh, our next uh, answer um, in symposium. So join us of the for the answer Western Region Region Leadership Symposium in San Diego. It's going to happen on December 2nd to the 6th of 2024. Uh, don't miss this incredible opportunity to connect, learn, and grow with leaders from all military branches, veterans, and civilians. If you want to know more information about this uh, symposium, go to the website www.ansomil.org, and you can actually have more information on the inc- upcoming symposium 2 to the 6th of December 2024 in uh, San Diego, California. So you can follow us in social media. Now, for now, stay safe, stay motivated, and we'll catch you next time in our The Answer Podcast. This is Captain Manuel Carlos signing off. Let's go, mi gente. Vamos allá.